And uh, we thank God for the goodness. Uh, this past Thursday, we I pray that you reminded yourself just how blessed you've been. And that if someone asked a question, did you have something to be thankful for? I hope you had an answer. Uh, we have been blessed if you know Christ as your personal Savior. You know that it is Him that has made the impact in your life and caused you to be where you're at today. And so as we begin to continue to look at what the new birth brings to us as children of God, that we would open up our understanding to God's Word and allow Him to minister to our hearts. I thank the Lord for even the snow that I didn't want that falls. <laughs> Yeah. And the cold weather that comes with it. Because in the other end, I thank him for the warmth of the furnace and the roof that covers. And we thank God tonight that we're able to assemble together and we look at this word and that you came out in the weather. I'm glad to have you here tonight. Father, we come tonight, Lord, and we are thankful, Lord, for the goodness that you bring how you watch over us and keep us, how you hold us along the way. Lord, as we look at your word tonight, it talks about your new birth, Lord, and how that is imperishable. That we understand, Lord, what you have given us, Lord, you gave it because of your great love. It's not something that we've earned, and it's not something that was owed to us. It is something that has come to us and been afforded to us, Lord, because of the death burial and the resurrection of your son, our Savior and our King. And so, Lord, we pray tonight, Lord, that as we come, that you would minister to our heart, that we would have clarity to know, Lord, that this work you have begun into us, you will you bring it to completion, and we can stand on the foundation of your love, that nothing is ever able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so now, Lord, I pray that you give us understanding your ears to hear, our heart to receive, and then the courage, Lord, to walk out the truth of Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When we were finishing up, if you flip it over on the next page, back one, um, I just want to look at 2B. Actually, if you look in the middle of the page, it says, there's nothing good in the old nature. And I said to you the last time when we were looking at that, that was the scripture that really set my heart apart in walking with the Lord. It freed me up that I had to stop. I didn't have to stop and worry about how good I might be or whatever. The word was clear. What dwells in me, there is nothing good in me. Took a lot of pressure off. Trying to be something that I cannot become. We've all struggled with that, but the problem is, is that in, Christ, in our Christian walk, we're still trying to be good and still understanding that we have been saved. And that's what causes us to change in our life. It's not about how good we are, because how good we are will never be good enough for us to enter into the presence of God. But it's about His goodness that has come into us that has made a difference. We looked at the scripture there in Romans. I talked about that there's nothing good in the old nature. The power to live a righteous life cannot be found in the old nature. In Romans 7, verse 14, it said, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, and so under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will, do, will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. It just sums it up is that as we, as children of God, have looked at our life, we understand that salvation allows us to be in a place that we could not get in our own. Here, the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, is letting us know that the, the thing that goes on within us, that it tells us that the law, though it was spiritual, the law could not save us. What it did point out to us is that we could not live a holy and righteous life that would allow us to come into the grace of God. For the word of God says if you failed in one area of the law, you failed it all. So it didn't matter that if you were almost good enough, it was not good enough to enter into the presence of the Lord. So it says that the law was, is spiritual, but I am carnal. It says that because the law told me to do all the right things that I needed to do to live a victorious life, the carnality within me caused me to hinder, come short of that that God has spoken. For what I am doing 
I do not understand. That we find ourselves doing things that we, in our heart, we did not want to do it. Did you ever think something, say something, and you say to yourself, what did, how come, you know? And sometimes in the midst of prayer, have you ever had, all of a sudden you're praying and then all of a sudden a thought comes in your head that is so far from God and you're saying, where did that come from? It tells us here that there's things that we desire to do to please and to walk in this relationship with God and yet we find that there's things I don't understand. For what I will to do, that that I desire to do, I find that I do not practice. What I'm desiring to do is living as a believer in Christ Jesus. I find that I keep coming up short. I don't put it into practice. I know what I ought to do and yet I find myself doing. But what I hate, that I do. The things that I know I need to run from, I find myself gravitating back to those things. It lets us know that in this flesh we will never be victorious. We need to live through the Spirit of God and through the strength that comes through that Spirit that we might live a life victorious. It says in verse 16, If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is, it, it, is, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin that dwells in me. And since this revelation is that though the spirit is willing, my flesh is weak. And so I recognize that in myself I cannot live a holy, righteous life in my own strength. I will never be able to live a life that will bring God glory and bring him honor. And so that I find that in myself I desire to do the will of God, but the sin nature dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And I said that is the scripture that changed my life early on in my Christian walk. That it gave me understanding because why? I, I wanted to know why do I keep failing at this life when I know that Christ is the answer. It's the way I want to live and it's what I want to do. I found out that the reason that I did it because why this nature and so I had to begin to get into the Word and begin to ask God to teach me what it is that I need to do because just trying to live good doesn't get me there. And it doesn't get any of us there trying to live good, trying to live right. Because I've heard people say to me many times, and you probably said it or had someone said to you, I'm trying my darndest to do it and I keep failing at it. Well, if you could do it in your, in your own ability, you wouldn't need Jesus. So it lets us know that I can't do it. And that's what Paul is saying here in the scripture. I can't do it apart from Jesus. Because in me, in me, in this flesh, in this person that I was born into, there dwells no good thing. Nothing that God can receive. It doesn't mean that I can't do something good. But it's not in, in a sense that it says that it is a God thing. Because see, the scriptures even remind us that there's things that Christians have done that even heathens didn't do. So it lets us know that we think that even heathens can do good things. And as heathens, we did do some good things, but they weren't righteous, nor were they holy. And it takes that to come into the presence of God. Because for us to do holy and to do righteousness is because of a transformation that has come through the new life and comes through Jesus Christ. So in verse 17, so, but now it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, there is nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but to how to perform what is good, I do not find. So again, the spirit is willing, the desire to do it, but I find that to be able to do it, I can't get there on my own. I need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in my life to be able to get me where I need to be. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Have you ever been there? The evil that I desire not to do is where I find myself at again. That that I, I don't want to come out of my mouth, that I don't want to allow it in my eye gate, I, in my ear gate to come out of my mouth gate, to, with my hands to touch or my feet to take me to. I, all of those things that we don't want to do. You're driving down the road, you got your praise music on, you're in the spirit and somebody cuts you off. And then you say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> Did you say, oh Lord, get him, get him. 
So what I'm saying is that that flesh part riles up in us unless we begin to recognize, and that's what Romans is telling us. We need to recognize that the nature of man is real and that we all deal with it. But when we understand that it is real, that God is the one who is touching and, and, and moving in our life, we can begin to move in the place that God would have us to do. So then in 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What a revelation that comes to us through this word is that we recognize we are capable of sinning even in Christ Jesus. Because why? We're still housed in this flesh. So we need to allow the Spirit of God to have His way. So the Bible teaches us on things that we need to do, how we allow the Word of God to wash it, to, to guide us and direct us, that we allow that Word and we meditate upon it. We allow that Word to lead and guide our lives by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We begin to desire the will of God and the God's ways in our life that we might be able to stand. So it tells us then that in part uh, 2b that the power to live a righteous life can only be found in the new nature. So again, it tells us that what we have in the old nature, we cannot do it. We cannot live righteous. We cannot live holy. We cannot please God. We find it only comes through the new nature. Now, what I, the reason I said what I did concerning these earlier verses there in Romans 7, a lot of people believe that possibly Paul was talking about before his conversion that this was a war that he had inside. But I also believe that Paul recognized that even though you're born again, you still deal with your flesh. Here's the flesh of Paul. Paul is out on the a missions trip and he's got John Mark with him. John Mark gets homesick and he wants to go back home. Paul wants to continue on and wants him to go with him. He decides to go home and then Paul says, go. And Barnabas goes with him and leaves. Paul did not want him with him because why? He was not strong enough, capable. There was not the mercy and the grace of God being given. And yet Paul teaches us about mercy and the grace of God. But he didn't give it to John Mark. And yet we find that there was a change later on, years down the road, that he says, send John Mark because he is needful to me. Now, not only did John Mark grow in his walk and his faith, as we read in, in the book of Mark, that he walked with God. He knew what, that, that, excuse me, that he knew what God had called him to. But it also means that Paul also grew. And where he didn't give the grace before, he was giving it now. Maturity, it doesn't matter who we are, we're always continually growing in our walk and relationship with God. And so when we look at this part here, that the power of to live in a righteous life can only be found in the new nature, Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ lived in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now there's a thing that's going on. I couldn't live a righteous, holy life living in my flesh. But now that I'm in Christ Jesus, I find that I can live a better life because why? Because I understand I have been born again through Christ Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. But now just the part that we have been have the new life in us, that doesn't still allow us to have victory in our life. What it does, though, it gives us the, the ability to stand and begin to walk and run in the truth of Scripture, led by the Holy Spirit, that we can begin to understand because I have Christ in me, I'm able to live a life that will give God glory and give him honor, and I recognize that in my flesh there dwells no good thing, so I'm on alert, knowing that my flesh might act up any time, and I must be aware of that, so I will stay in the presence of God, knowing that when I am strong, I am able to overcome any temptation that will come my way. I'm able to walk away from the things that may tempt me. I may stop hanging out in places, and I'll stop hanging out with the play, play mates in those places that I might walk a, a life with Christ that would bring him glory and bring him honor, but also it frees us up to live the life that we desire to live. I said like that because why? Nobody ever lives a life and wake up one day and say, I want to wreck it. 
Nobody does that. I just wake up one morning and say, let me just mess my life up completely. But in this flesh, we are prone to do that. The Bible says the sin is the spark is to fly upward. So that nature is always there. But when I'm aware of what the problem is, let me ask you, um, when the snow came, how did you drive on it? You drove cautiously. You know that I could slip any time. You didn't get on it. You didn't spin around the curb fast. You didn't do any of those things. Now, you might have done that when you were 17 and 18. But now that you're wiser, you took your time. You got. You said, "Why? I want to get there. I don't want to have to get it and push out of the ditch. I don't want to have to do anything like that. I, I don't want to be stranded out here. I'm going to drive carefully. What it says is that I recognize the danger. When we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we recognize that in this flesh, there are things that are going to come at us. And because we have the Spirit of God, we're on, we're on alert. We're saying to this flesh, I'm, on, I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to let you ruin what I know God is calling me to do. And it's because you're aware of it. And that's what Paul is making the people understand. That he's making them aware that, that we have this relationship with Christ. And because of that, it is, it is no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives within me. And the life which I now live. How he said, the life I live now as a believer in Christ Jesus. While I'm housed in this flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness kind comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So it's just letting us know, I do not set grace aside, that we're saved by grace. Nothing that we earn, nothing that we can do on our own that will allow us to walk victoriously in Christ. It is a gift from God. And so when I know that I have this gift from God that wants me to walk victoriously in him, I begin to suit up in that armor of God, knowing that when I'm, and when I'm in him, I can go forward. In fact, it says that what? That even the gates of hell cannot prevent the church, we're the church, from going forward. Because why? We have Christ's life inside of us. We are born again, a new creation. So as we begin to mature in the things of the Lord, begin to understand what God has given to us in this new life, that we begin to understand that though I'm housed still in this sinful nature of man, this here that is continuously dying. Yeah, the baby born is born to die. And while we're housed in this flesh, this flesh is it is temporal. It is not an eternal body that we have, but we got that coming because our faith and our promises that are in Christ. That we know that in this decaying body that God says you can live victoriously in me when you understand who you are and what you got. It makes a difference if you know what you got. If you know what, who you are and who it is that is giving you the grace to live victoriously in him, you begin to stand on a different, on a solid foundation and not just on mere sand. The note says, if you have them born again, you have two natures, the old nature and the new, and you are walking according to one or of one of the two. So it says that even that you're born in one and you've been born in the other, and it, and it says, and you are walking according to one of the two. You're going to walk in the flesh, you're going to walk in the spirit. Because you have that in you. Examine your Christian walk in the light of God's word. Romans 8, 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So that's what we were talking about earlier. We are talking about that now that you know what you have, you are now walking with the understanding that, yes, I'm housed in this flesh, but I'm born again in Christ Jesus, and the greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I can overcome the temptations of this world because of Christ that is in me. Now I'm going to be tempted. 
But Jesus was tempted in every point, and what it says, he did not sin. Temptation will come to all of us, but we don't have to embrace it because we have new life in Christ Jesus. Now, the greatest way that I have found to live victoriously in the, in the, in the life in Christ Jesus, it says when you are tempted, when you are dealing with those things, it tells us to run from those things or get out of there. Get out of there. So the things of this flesh is like hell just kept on fire. And if, the, if you heard the alarm go off and it says the building's on fire, nobody stands around and says, well, it's okay. It's cold outside. I'm just going to stay right in here. No, you're going to get out of there and go to a place of safety. Well, Christ is our safety. What we have in Christ allows us to live victoriously in him. Now, I'm not saying that it's that easy. I'm just saying when you're aware of it, you can do something about it. You know where to go. You know who to call. You know who to, to get with. You get down before the Lord and begin to tell and say to him, I know what I have, Lord, because I have you in my life. So it says that if you live in the flesh, according to the flesh, you set your mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So now there's something else that comes with this great salvation. It's not only that we have life in Christ, but you also have peace in Christ Jesus. Now the difference is, is that when you know that you ain't doing what you're supposed to do and you know that you're not in the right place with God, there is no peace. There is no peace when you're walking in disobedience because you know. You know, you just wonder when the rug's going to be yanked out from under you, but you know that you're in disobedience, and you're just waiting for the hammer to come down on you. And so it says that because of that, then we're aware of it. Because why? When you're walking with Christ, not only do you have the freedom that comes in Christ Jesus, you also have life and you also have peace. Because the carnal minded is enmity, it's warring against God, and for it is not subject to the law of God. Now, we said that the law was good because it, it points out how God would have you to live. But it says the flesh will never want to walk in the goodness and the righteousness of God. It, it fights against that. It says, nor indeed can be. So the flesh will never be able to glorify God. So we need to stop saying, I'm just trying so hard to get my life in order and nothing seems to be working. And then you ask the question, the word of God says this, are you trying that? The word of God says this, are you trying that? The word of God says do this, are you doing that? The word of God says this things here. Well, if we don't apply the principles of God to our life, how do we expect to have an overcoming life in this flesh? Now, the Word of God says that we have to know that, that the difference, and that's what Paul is pointing out, that we are here, free in Christ Jesus, but we're housed still in this sinful nature, and so we have to make choices every day, or the Word of God says die daily. Die daily to this flesh so that why the Spirit of God can live inside of us. So it says, because the carnal mind is enmity, fights against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot, well, he cannot please God. There's no way that we can ever please God operating in our own understanding, our own strengths, our own ideas. We have to continually be walking according to the truth of Scripture, application of God's word to our life, being led by the Holy Spirit, choosing to do the things that God has called us to do. And then when we find that we're struggling in that nature, we cry out to God and say, Lord, help me. What did Peter do when he found himself walking on the water? And all of a sudden, he looked at the, the storms of the world of, of, uh, that was around him. The waves were coming and all those things. He said he began to sink. And the first thing he said was, Lord, save me. Help me. And he said that immediately God was there. That's what we have to learn to do. Stop trying to do this thing on your own. You can't do it on your own. You need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And you have to be, what is the word that they use for the fire department? And you need to be first responders. First responders immediately go to do the things that God would have us to do. We cry out to Jesus. We say, Lord, you're my only help. You're my only strength. Help me, Lord, in this so I can walk away from that temptation that is there. And we find if we become first responders that we, we move quickly, we, we think. You know, do you remember the old commercial that the person is hot and it's, it's this and that and the other and they're, they, they're drinking something else and then, and then someone tells them, 
You could have had a V8. You could have had this. You could have had that. God tells us that we can have everything we want in Him when we begin to choose Him. Stop looking for things in the world to satisfy you and that only Christ is the one that can satisfy us, get us to the place where we need to be. Then in part three, as we look at it, it talked about the new birth is imperishable. First Peter 1, verse 23. Having been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we've already been talking about that because why? That if we're going to walk victoriously in Christ Jesus, we walk through the word of God, which lives in us, and then when we buy it, and it's there with us, for what? Forever. We have this life in Christ, and we have it forever. We can always draw from the well of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we're looking at here, it tells us in 1 Peter uh, 1, it's, uh, 23, it says, shows we have two seeds, two births, and two natures. The seed of death, coming that from Adam, and then the seed of life that comes through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. We've been born in the natural, we've been born in the spiritual. And then the nature of God, we've just began to talk about it, and the nature of the flesh. And that it says that, that I will to do, I find myself not doing, that there's a battle going on, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So let's look at number one. It says the corruptible seed issues a corruptible nature. Romans 1, 23. Let's look at 19b. It says, yes, God has shown himself to them. There are things about him that people cannot see. His eternal power and all the things that make him God. But since the beginning of the world, those things have been easy to understand by what God has made. So people have no excuse for the bad things they do. They knew God but they did not give glory to God or thank him. It tells us that man in the beginning understood that the things that were good, that there was a God. They looked at nature. They looked at the beauty of, of what God has created, and they began to say, this is a God. If you've ever seen the ocean, seen the mountains, seen these things that, that are on this planet, and you begin to think, this is so beautiful. This is beautiful. This has to be God. But when you held your first child, you had to know there was a God. When you felt that baby, moms, when it was you were carrying them, and they're moving a foot over here and an arm over here, and they're doing their gymnastic stuff on you and stuff, you knew then that this was life and this life came from God. But then it says that somehow man comes to a place that he forgets all of these things. He forgets about that there was a God that he could see it in nature. He could see it. There was not a time that man that did not hold that child and say, this is a gift from God. And yet now we live in a day where people struggle with the idea and think that the baby is formed because of a man idea or a woman's desire. All of these things here has nothing to do with that. Sperm and egg do not cause a baby to be formed. It is still formed by the very breath of God. Because why? The Word of God says he is the giver of what? Life. Baby has what? Life. Life cannot come from any other place except from the person who is life. Life. And I struggle when Christians are, are, are today are just struggling over these things about what is it. Well, you know, and this and that and the other. That's, that's, there was nothing. God said, let it be. If God can form it out of the dirt, well, this is what I'm going to tell you. I don't know it for a fact, but this is what some smart people said. That they're now able to see the connection when the sperm and the egg become alive. And they said... When you see it happening, there's a spark at that very moment. The breath of life, the power of God. Now, that's what the scientists said. They've noticed that. That in conception, when the seed comes, that it says it becomes life. And there's a spark in it. You can see the life force come. Now, I don't know how they did it, how they planned it, and why were they in your bedroom. But I'm saying... <laughs> what you want to do for science. And so, but what I am saying, I believe that life only comes through God. Uh, 
Some may say, well, it was just the right time. But the Word of God says that when the women cried out to him and said, Lord, I am barren. Lord, touch me. It says that he heard the cry and he let them know that you will have a child. Now, he said that because why? He's the giver of life. And those women became pregnant. Not because of making sperm, because of the giver who gives life. And yet it tells us that since the beginning of the world, those things have been easy to understand. Wasn't that something that said that we understand? We looked around in creation and said, that has to be a God. When you see the, 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 the big uh, wells and uh, see all of these things of creation and stuff, you know there had to be a God. And yet when you begin to look at the nature of man, and it doesn't matter what color of skin or, or what part of the world you're from, you know the features of man, when you begin to look at them, and you can be in a different country, be in a different place, and you look at somebody, whether they're white or black, green or yellow, and you say, don't that look like Uncle so-and-so? Different nationality, different this, different that. What it's saying is that same creator, same creator made us all. Everybody got two ears and nose and mouth, eye, this and that and the other. And what you find is that man looks like man. Made like the creator. Just Dennis. Yeah, one of my, uh, one of my old best friends, mm -hmm. 100% Italian. Uh -huh. And years after I knew him, mm -hmm. I happened to meet a black guy, mm -hmm. looked exactly like him, mm -hmm. had yeah. the same nose, same facial structure, same Amen. beard, Amen. everything. Amen. And that's what I'm saying. Because why when you're looking at man, we're created from God. People ought to look like people. And so there are Another gorgeous woman and handsome man that looks like every one of you in the room tonight. Now, you haven't ran into him yet, but there's somebody to say, come up to you, you remind me of so-and-so. You look just like so-and-so. And you may find out there's no blood involved other than the blood of Jesus. That God, that life comes through him. So when we're looking at the scriptures, it's just saying to us that the if God allows and, and, and lets us see, then it says that man becomes foolish. They knew God, but they did not give glory to God or thank him. Their thinking became useless. Their foolishness, foolish minds were filled with darkness. They said they were wise, but they became fools. They traded the glory of God who lives forever for the worship of idols made to look like earthly people, birds, animals, and snakes. What it's saying is that you can't picture God other than you look at everything and know there is a God because why? no one ever knows what God looks like. We've never met him. We see a lot of pictures of what Jesus looks like, but ain't hey, none of them Jesus. And we have no idea what he looked like. But if I went over there to Israel, I would say that he might look like an Israelite. Chances are that he would be. He probably is not not six foot four. I said, they look like Bailey's. They're short people. They're not awfully tall or anything like that. I mean, in my family, I'm a giant at 5'8". Yeah, we're short people. So I'm just saying is that we really don't know. And then God doesn't want us to know. We, he wants us to trust in him. Man wants to run at something that he can identify and touch, and that's what it said. So they began to carve things those, and worship those things, and God says, no, worship me. Believe in me. So our walk with the Lord is what? It's by faith. It's not about having the cross around your neck. There's nothing wrong with the cross. There's nothing wrong with having those things and stuff, or even the things that you, we hold on to our Bibles and stuff like that. But I'm just going to tell you, it's the Word of God. It's life. It is those things there. But if you drop them in water, it'll get wet. And if it gets wet, you dry it off. It's not the end of the world. Because why? It's a printed paper of the Word of God. You can always go out and buy it. It may become dear, but sometimes we get the, to worshiping the, that book. Is, 
that book gives the word of God and it's powerful and it's this and it's that and this and that and the other. Well, you can hold that book all day long, but until you apply the principles of that book to your life, nothing changes. Holding the book, having the book, does not get you to a place where you need to be. And if your family was like my family, they had a book this big, set this high, it had all kind of stuff stuck in it, usually about family members who died. Never open. How do you know? Because when you picked it up, you could see where the dust was around it and, and, and covering it because why? It was called the family Bible that the family never even touched. So um, we find that he says that they did not run after the things of God. They wanted to give glory to something that made sense to them. Our walk with the Lord is what? It's a faith walk. It's a walk that we walk with in Him. It said they traded the glory of God who lives forever for the worship of idols that look like earthly people, birds, animals, and snakes. Because they did these things, God left them and left them to go their sinful way, wanting only to do evil. When it tells us that when we begin to look for something else other than the, the power of God, man becomes foolish. AA started out as a great program. It was a program that was based on scripture and all of those things there. And they believed that if people began to search after the things of God, that it would help them in their times of addicted behavior and allow them to set free. It became so big and, and so, so strong that it became to become something that went into place and all of a sudden they stopped talking about God and said, now we'll call him a higher power. And so why? We wanted to make everybody comfortable. Well, either you wanted people to be delivered from their drugs and alcohol, or you wanted people to be, and wanted them to set free, or you wanted them to be comfortable, which allows them to do what? To operate in their own sinful nature. And so what we do is we water down things that God had made strong for us, that we could stand upon, and we watered it down because why we want to make people comfortable. But the word of God is true. And God says he is the only way. And for us to, to say different, we allow ourselves to fall into the trappings that the world has found this self falling into. And says as a result, they became full of sexual sin, using their bodies wrongly with each other. They traded the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served what they had been created instead with a, with have been created instead of the God who created those things who should be praised forever. So it said they made what? They made things that look like birds and those things there, and yet it was God that said, let there be. Now they made something out of wood or out of, out of, out of metal or something that can't fly, and God made a bird that can't fly. And they'd rather worship it than worship God who is the creator. And we need to know that we as children of God have to understand this because we're going to be challenged in our walk. But then it goes on to say to us, the seed of man became depraved and in the seed of Adam when he sinned in the garden of Eden. And we know the story, but I want us to look at it. In verse 1 it said, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not sin, that you shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may not eat the fruit, we, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. God never said about you should not touch it. You don't, you could, you don't eat it. Don't eat it. So if you don't eat it, that means you can't touch it because if you, don't, you ain't eating it, the only way you can eat it is to touch it. He didn't say that. He said, don't eat it. And so if you can't eat it, there ain't no way to eat it except you touch it. He told him, don't eat it. She said, God said that don't touch it. So she's already off base. God did not say that. At least you die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now the truth of that scripture is this, God is perfect and God knows evil. He knows evil because anything that's not of him is evil. He knows evil. 
He did not want to hold that breath. There's space that God never wanted man to experience until the proper time. And there's things that we have gotten ourselves into that we find and we're saying, God, how did I get in this mess? He says, you're doing things I told you not to do. And I would tell you some few things about my own life of doing those things, but we don't have enough time. We need to keep moving. Or possibly you could tell me some things about your own life. That when you said, um, I got a scheme, which is different than God's plan, but I think I can make it work. What do you think, Chad? Let's go for it. What we find is that man finds himself in that situation. It says, if you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Just like a good parent, there's things that we never wanted our children to touch or have them. There's things that we did not. My 10-year-old granddaughter knows more now than I knew when I was 17. Yeah. Yeah. And she has no business knowing those things. She's not. She's 10. Need to be embracing being 10. If you remember when you were that age, we had fun. We knew how to have fun. We ran, we played, we did those things because why? That's what you did. We worked, but we also knew how to have fun. We didn't have to have anybody entertain us. We could entertain ourselves. We would get together. We would do all of those things. Why? We were doing what children do. But we live in a day today that we think that, well, the child needs a cell phone and stuff just in case of emergency. I don't care. Your 9-year-old, your 10-year-old doesn't need a cell phone. They're in school. If there's a problem, the school has your number. They will call you. The child doesn't have to have a phone to let you know where they're at. They ought to be in school. If they're supposed to be in school, that's where they're at. We're doing things that allows them. And the problem is, is that I'm not talking just as a grandparent. I'm just saying your 9-year-old, 10-year-old knows more about how to work that phone, that, that pad than the person, the parent of that child or the grandparent. And if, you, if you're not sure about how to get your stuff to work, give it to one of the kids. And they will say, nothing to it, Grandma. I remember a six-year-old saying, nothing to it, Grandpa. This is what you do, Grandpa. You're doing it wrong. You do. How is a six-year-old supposed to know what to do on an electronic device? It says that these things happen. And what happens, their eyes are open to things that God never wanted them to experience. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, her food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it, its fruit, and ate. And she also gave it to her husband, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The relationship they had with God, God is a spirit, and they could hear the spirit of God. They were so in tune with the things of God they sensed, they knew the Spirit was, God was coming upon them. To have a relationship with God, that you could even hear the footsteps of God, that you knew that He was approaching. God wants us to have a relationship with Him that we could begin to know and sense when the power of the, of the Holy Spirit is coming up on you and in you, that you know that the things that you're doing, the things that you're saying are not of yourself, they truly are of God. And so when they said that the woman saw the fruit and she ate of it, nothing happened. Nothing happened when the woman ate of the fruit. I said then she gave it to the man, and when he ate of it, their eyes were open. Now the word tells us earlier that they were they were they were naked and they were not ashamed. Because why? Their hearts were right with God. They were in the right place with God. But when they stepped into sin. They were ashamed of themselves because they were uncovered. They were uncovered and, and, and they knew that they were seen and operating in a way now that was not of God. We have a sensitivity in Christ Jesus. We know when we're operating according to the truth of Scripture and we know the difference when we're not. 
We're waiting sometimes to say, well, God reveals that to us. We've already been revealed. The Holy Spirit speaks to his children to let us know when we are not in the place that God would have us to be. We know it. We don't. We may not know what the scripture has to say about what we know is not where God would have us to be. The woman saw, she ate, she gave it to the man, and he ate, and they were naked. Their eyes were open, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves around to cover up themselves. The problem is, is that they covered themselves and what they thought would cover. They tried to do something in the natural. But we're going to find out later what they did did not satisfy what God had in store for them. They heard the sounds of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Isn't that just like a parent? Knowing exactly where you are at and then asking you, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I command you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman who, whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. Mm. God asked him a question. <coughs> Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat of? And his reply was not yes or no. He said, God, I was all right all by myself. You made this woman. This woman messed up everything for us because I was fine. I was okay. No, you don't want to put me to sleep, Lord. You don't want to pull her from my rib. It was you, Lord, that, that called me to pray. Lord, I was fine. We're always still been looking for excuses. Adam just opened up the door and we found ourselves blaming one another from that day forward. She gave it to me and I ate. I was naked. I, I did those things, God. I, I did it. The woman you gave me, she gave it me the tree and I ate. The eyes never opened until Adam ate. Adam knew the plan of God. Adam shared the plan of God with the woman. But Adam, God spoke to Adam and told Adam how things ought to be. And it's because of that, the seed of man is corrupt. It brings forth death. It did not have, Adam was created to be eternal. He was created. In fact, I've heard doctors say that when you look at the human body and you look at it, a healthy human body, the parts, everything that is in that person, they are made not to wear out, and yet we know they do. We know that man with all of his technology and, and his ability to make and shape and form, we have new knees, we have new hips, we have new things, but they will tell you, we cannot, we cannot duplicate the original because what God made is better than anything that we can ever do. God still made man to be eternal. And they said they wear out and we're not sure what we wear out because of sin. That's why the body does not sustain eternity because of the sin nature. Adam blamed the woman and the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent de deceived me and I ate. It wasn't my fault, it's the serpent's fault. She learned quick from Adam. You don't take, the, you, don't, you, don't, you, 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 you play dumb. You just go ahead and don't, 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 don't say yes, just blame it on somebody else and she blamed it on the serpent. Now I know what some of you ladies are probably thinking. If Adam had spent more time talking to Eve, Eve wouldn't have found herself talking to the serpent. So Adam was messed up from the beginning. No. It says corruptible man can produce only corruptible seed. And that's what we find that in Adam. It says before the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. The good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that, tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thereby, their fruit, therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. It tells us that you know the difference of the seed born of man and the seed born of God, that there is a difference. And then what it says is that they're not perfect. The man born of God is not perfect. But as we strive to run after the transformation of what God is doing in our life, we'll continue to bring forth fruit. And the word of God tells us this fruit that will be remain. But it lets us know that those who do not have the, that, the life of Christ in them, that no matter what they do, will never be able to be good enough to, that they may enter. Because why? Bad fruit, bad, bad fruit tree cannot produce good fruit. No matter how good the sinner thinks he is, he'll never be good enough to come into the presence of God. And we need to be able to say that with boldness. And you think, well, that's not fair. Hmm. God says this is how it is. And this is the fair thing about it. You decide what you want to be, alive in me or dead in yourself. When the gospel comes, the Holy Spirit will begin to minister to each and every one of us. It allows us to be able. Some will harden their heart and say, I don't want any parts of that. And yet others will say, would God love someone like me? I've been the worst of the worst. And it says, well, he saved the man that was hanging on the tree next to him. And if he can save him, surely he can save you. And then we make it more real. No matter how bad you were, I probably was worse. He saved me. He can save you. The question is, do you believe that God is able to save, forgive you of your sins because of what Jesus did? He died that you might have life. He rose from the grave that you might have him. The truth of the gospel lets us know that no matter how good good is in man, it never will be good enough to enter into the kingdom of God. Number one tells us here in Romans 3, 23, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, in the sight of God, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. That scripture says it all. There is no one born holy, righteous, able to enter into the presence of God. And are justified. It says now all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It tells us that our lives are only new because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We brought nothing to the table that allows us to be in the presence of God other than we have faith in his son. Faith alone. Nothing else allows man to be transformed from death to life other than his faith in the scripture, his faith in Jesus Christ who the Father sent to take our sins to be the, 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 the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. So it tells us that all have sinned, and that's so important, that we find that it doesn't matter. Nobody is good enough. And then it says, because all are born in sin, Psalms 51, 5, that we read it before. But 3, it says, for I know my transgressions, and David is talking, my sin is forever before me. That is something that we all recognize. We don't need someone to tell us how bad we are. We already know how bad we are. I don't need to have to come to church and somebody say, you know, you're the worst person I've ever met in my life. Do you not know that I'm the, I know I'm the worst person. That's why I'm here. That's why I want to change in my life. It tells us that 
in that David is writing, that my transgressions, my sins are ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. It says that God knows every heart of man. He knows our circumstance and situation. And it's only through the knowledge and the saving grace of Jesus Christ can we be set apart in the things of the Lord. And God knows the heart. He knows where we're at. He knows who is saved. It's only through the faith in Christ alone that will we find ourselves blameless in the time of judgment because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because why? I was born in sin. And evil is where I'm at. And we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Again, we spoke about that, that David is letting us know that he was born of a corruptible seed, and that he was conceived in sin. Because why? His dad was a sinner. And the seed that came from him is the seed of Adam. And Adam's seed is corrupt. Adam's seed brings forth death. Behold, you delight in the truth and the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the, in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. To come into the understanding that the only way we have change, that God has to cleanse us, God has to touch us, God has to, to come in and give new life to us. He says, purge it, kill it, that I might be new in you. The note is, you are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. I like the saying that sinners do what? what sinners do. We need to stop trying to make sinful people righteous and holy and accountable for their actions. Sinners do what sinners do. Now when we sin, we sin because we're disobedient to the spirit that is in us and we're housed in this flesh. But we find ourselves when we seek God, the Holy Spirit is always wooing us and drawing us close to us. And so I have to stand there many times and go, do I or don't I? And I know what you're thinking. I got the devil on one side and the angel on the other. And I'm listening to him. I'm listening to this one here. But that's how it seems to be at times. But we find ourselves that we know that we're desiring to do the will of God. We surrender ourselves under him so that we can begin to escape the temptations that come our way. The word of God tells us there's no temptation known to man that God has not given us a means of escape from. So that we don't have to say, I don't have no other choice. I have a choice every day because I have the spirit of God that is in me and in you. And so we are without excuse. God has touched our lives. It tells us that the incorruptible seed issues an incorruptible nature. So we already looked at the corruptible seed does what it does even while we're housed in this flesh and have a new spirit in us. Here it says in first, Second Peter 1, we look at verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That tells us about this relationship with Jesus Christ and that the power, the divine life of God is in us through our faith in Jesus Christ alone. And his divine power has given us everything we need for godly living. I am without excuse. Now, and I'm going to tell you that it just doesn't happen because I'm born again. The Word of God says, well, we take the Word of God and we study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly able to divide the Word of God apart. So it's telling us that in that Word that we are born again in Christ Jesus and the Spirit of God in us is wanting to guide us, lead us in such a way that we are able to resist the temptations that will come because we have Christ and we desire the greater thing that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we study to show ourselves approved, I don't have to be ashamed. I won't do that thing. I won't fall into that place. I, I won't say those things. I won't not act that. I will not wish those things upon you. I'll not do these things that will come because why? God has given us a way of escape. But when I fall short of the glory of God, when the children of God fall short of God's glory, there is shame in the midst of it. 
But it says if I allow God to have his way, I can escape that. I can move forward from that. We can move on to the place where God would have us to be. So therefore, these he has given, those that put their hope and trust, these he has given us his very great and precious promise so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and have escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. So it tells us that greater is he that is in us and we can escape. We can move away from the things that trip us up. Whatever it might be. And for everyone it's maybe different. But it's still the same corruption. It's that that is not of the Lord. It doesn't have to be big. It just has to be not of the Lord. It isn't about that you did murder or did you robbed a bank or anything. It just has to be not of the Lord. And if it's not of the Lord, it's sin. If it's not of the things of God, it's sin. And I don't have to then say, well, then wait a minute. Your sin is bigger than mine. The last time I saw sin is spelled with three words, sin, S-I-N, sin. And if you sin, you're coming short of the glory of God. He doesn't say how much sin takes you from that place of the glory of God. It tells us that if you sin, you come short of the glory of God. And so I don't. I, I want to make that clear because sometimes as Christians, we still want to measure our sin against your sin. My sin ain't as bad as your sin, Larry. If I'm honest, I'm probably a little bit ahead of you. Um, yeah, you're pretty competitive. He's, he's right on my heels. He's trying to catch me. And so what we find is that that nature is always there. And that's what this, we've been studying tonight. We've been looking at we're housed in this flesh. This thing is real. This salvation is real. If what God has given us is real. And we find ourselves moving farther from where we used to be to where God would have us to be. And that lets us know that what God has given us is real. When we find ourselves desiring the things of the Lord, it is real because the Word of God says that the flesh does never desire the things of God. Only the Spirit desires the things of the, of the Lord. If the Spirit only desires the things of the Spirit. What the flesh desires the things of the flesh. And when the children of God begin to desire the things of God, you know your salvation is true because there's nothing in man that causes him to want to run after God except the spirit of God that is in us and God says it this way in his word that his spirit bears witness with his spirit that is in us it bears witness and that's how we know that we are in him and he is in us the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of, in, in the world caused by the evil desires, that we have life in Christ Jesus. The note, the new birth, it produces the divine nature. The new nature cannot sin because it is the divine nature of God. 2 Peter 1, excuse me, 4. And since God cannot sin, the new nature that issues... Um, from the, the Holy Seed cannot sin. So that life and that that comes out of him cannot sin. So we have his life in us cannot sin. That of his life that comes out of us cannot sin. We're walking in the life. And it says that John tells us that his life in us is the light of men. So we have God's light in us. You cannot corrupt that which is incorruptible. Therefore, the incorruptible seed of God issues a new nature that cannot be corrupted by anything or in any way. Man has made some metals that you can take and you can hit and you can bang it up and you can ding it and, you can, and then man made some metals that you can't bend, you cannot break, you can't, you can't pull it apart, you can't do these things with it. God says, my seed is greater than that. When I give you seed, I give you new life. Ain't nothing able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That he says, I am in you. Death can't separate you. Nothing above the earth, nothing below the earth can separate you from the love of God. That he's letting us know because people are wondering, you know, can I lose my salvation? You can't lose something that God gave you. 
If God gave you new life, he gave you new life. Because why? You put your faith in Christ Jesus. So the question comes down to, you're coming short of the glory of God? Yes, I'm coming short of the glory of God. To stop it, because you have new life in you. Did you accept Christ as your personal Savior? Yes, I did. I asked him to come, forgive me of my sin. I wanted him to live. I believe in the salvation message of God, that God came born of a virgin, walked this earth 33 years, and with signs and wonders, he was beaten for my sin. He was nailed on the cross. He died in my place. I believe he was put in the grave, and on the third day he rose, and I believe that he died for me. The Word of God says, when you believe that, you have new life in Christ Jesus. He comes in to you, and because he gave it to you, you can't undo something that he has done. Now, when people tell me, well, I was a Christian, and I walked away from the things of the Lord, I'm going to tell you, you never were a Christian, because Christians do not walk away from the things of the Lord. I don't care how messed up, if you've ever met anyone that's messed up, and you see them out in the world, and you're talking to them in their time of struggle in life, and you begin to talk to them about the things of the Lord, all of a sudden, I've seen the continents change when you start to talk about Jesus. And all of a sudden, I hear the testimonies of the things of the Lord and what they know God has done. And as they continue to talk, I begin to hear the reason for their stumble. Their stumble is because no one told them the power of the Word of God. No one told them about the power of the life of Christ that is in them and what they have when they have Christ in them. They found themselves dealing with situations and they tried to work it out the best they knew. The loss of a loved one, the breaking of a relationship, all of those things, the loss of a job, loss of their income, all of those things have caused people to find themselves that they're struggling and they found no hope for themselves. And so they took that way because they thought that was deserving for them to do. But greater is he. And how does that look like? The word of God says that the prodigal son found himself in that situation. But it said one day he came to his, his senses. Children of God will come to their senses. And they will be able to say, I know where I need to go. I know where I need to go. They're talking about I just need to go to him. Who is able to save, who is able to transform, who is able to keep me, who is able to lift me up. Turn me around. The old book said, and place my feet on solid ground. That he is able to do that in each and every one of us. And so it doesn't matter how far. His seed is incorruptible. That person will find themselves standing before the Lord in that great day. And there may be some of you that will be able to throw many crowns at his feet. And the only crown that that other person would have is the crown of righteousness. Faith in the Lord alone. It got him there. He may not have been the greatest witness in none of those things. No might have made to come to know the Lord but that. And we say sometimes it is hard to believe that God would allow someone to come in that way. But then the word tells us that he was working one day and that he needed helpers. And he was hiring helpers to come and work for this amount. Some came and they worked all day and he says, I need some more helpers. So he went out and he got some more at another time. And they got to work and said, I need some more helpers. And, and he got them and, and he brought them out. And, and then he said, one hour left to go. I got to go get some more helpers. And he got in the last hour and he got, and they worked that last hour. Then he said, all right, guys, line up. And so they lined up. The one who worked the last hour came and he gave him a day's wages. And the people that have been there all day said, man, if he made him that much and I've been here all day, then i got something coming to him. Man, he's going to really give me something. And the word of God said that those who came at the beginning of the day, they got mad because he gave them the same amount as he gave the person that worked one hour as to those who have been at this all day long. And he said, did you not come and agree to that that I offered you eternal life? Yeah. Then why are you, well, you gave that person. It's mine to give. See, there may be some that may think, I've been a Christian for so long, this and that, the other, this and that. And this person just come to know the Lord in the last minute. That ain't right. Been the biggest heathen in the whole town. And now he gets to come to the Lord. That ain't fair. The Lord said, is it not mine to give? Who is the giver of life? Well, you are. Is it not mine then to give? Yes, it is, Lord, that I'll give it to whoever I choose. So we find that 
And perfect people meet the perfect one where we're seeing the crown of righteousness through Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's by faith alone, not by your works, not by how good you were or how long you've been a Christian, but it's by the fact that it was faith alone that caused us to be saved. And so it says that nature, the seed nature, the incorruptible seed of God, is just a new nature that cannot be corrupt in any way or in any way, any time or in any way. That because why? The indestructible life of Christ is indestructible. It's eternal. His life is eternal, and we have that life in us. The new birth produces life of Christ, and this life is made living in man by the indwelling Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, verse 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead uh, because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So here the word of God is making this clear that if you don't know Jesus, that you're in death. If you know Jesus as your savior, you're in life. That Christ, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is alive because of righteousness. You have life because of Jesus Christ. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. That's why I say many times to, to people who say, I hope that I've done enough. No, you have faith in him. It says right here in the Word, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who dwells in you. You have Christ in you. Heaven is a given. Nobody is working to go to heaven. We are left here to do the work, the labor that God has called us to, to be light in the midst of darkness, to witness Christ Jesus, to equip and build up others in the most holy faith that they would want to know. We are here to make disciples. We're here to have followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we are left here. We're not here, left, we're not been left here to work our way to heaven. We have been left here to do a greater work because there's many of us who are believers in Christ, that are going out into the harvest field and sharing the good news that many people can come to know Christ as their Savior. That's why we're left here in this simple world, to be witnesses of the saving grace of Jesus. The seed of man is corruptible, the birth of man is natural, and that, therefore, the nature of man is sinful. The seed of God is incorruptible, the new birth is spiritual, and therefore, the new nature is sinless. We are sinless because we are in Christ Jesus. When Father looks at us, he is looking at us through the lens of his Son. And in his Son, there is no sin. When he sees you, he sees the work, the finished work of his Son. And so it's not about our perfection, it's about the perfection of his son that he sees. When the word tells us that our sins are being cast into the seed and God doesn't remember. Now that's not true, God knows everything. What it means is that it has no place with God. And so it doesn't determine how bad you've been, how good you've been, if you had a good week or a bad week, it doesn't matter about that. Did you put your faith in my son? 
And we as believers are to encourage one another that why? That we might run this race to completion. So if you think you got a brother or sister who's not carrying their load, doing what God has called them to do, you ask them, are you in the race or not? Come on, let's run this thing. God has called us to this place. Because why? This is the life that he has given us. And so we're growing in this understanding that it's not about how I knuckle I get myself that I can do this. Oh, I'm going to work at this now, this and that and the other. That's like the smoker who tries to quit smoking and they do everything and they, they bought chewing gum, they bought this, they smoke out of this, they do this here, they throw this away, they don't throw it far enough that they can't find it, but they throw it away, they... And then one day they just say, I'm done. And they said, what's the difference? I just turned it over to God. I can't do this. That's got a hold on me and I can't break it. And so, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. They found themselves going through the same thing that people with drugs and alcohol go through. They had to die to themselves. But when we decide to let Christ live in us, he empowers us in ways that we can never do in ourselves. And that's what this teaching of new life is about. New birth. We have been empowered by God to live victoriously in Him. All right. Any questions? Not next week, but the week after. We will finish up this. Here we got one more, and then we'll also start a new one. And, uh, and we're moving towards the end. Next week, you no, know, they're having a... Uh, what is it? Uh, night in Bethlehem? Yeah. One starry night. Huh? One starry night. One starry night. Bethlehem is last year or something. Okay. All right. One starry night. And, uh, and we invite the adults to come be part of it. There will be some snacks of some sort. There will not be a meal like you had tonight. That was great. And um, um, But we will um, meet the following week. And we'll finish up this on the new birth. There. Did everyone have an opportunity tonight to uh, put down their prayer request? All right. Then let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace. And we thank you, Lord, that it's by grace we have been saved, not of works that we could boast, boast in ourselves, Lord. For, Lord, we come to understand that dwells in me no good thing, but because of your life in us, Lord, we now can be trusted. Not because of the old sinful nature, but because of the new life you have given. Lord, I thank you for new life. New life allows us to go to places we could not get into ourselves. And Lord, may we be mindful, Lord, of this new birth, to know that it came from you. May we learn, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we desire to walk and grow in you, that we'll find ourselves shedding of the, the sinfulness of man. And that we'll find ourselves, Lord, bringing forth fruit in you that will remain. And so, Lord, I pray that tonight, Lord, that we'll be encouragers, Lord, in this race as we're running it together. It's not about how fast I can run, but it's that will I run hard enough to finish. And so, Lord, I pray that we will encourage each other to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. That when we find ourselves in a situation, let us be bold to say, I need prayer. I need help. Pray for me. And so, Lord, I, as I say that, I ask for my brothers and sisters to pray for me, that I might be all that God would have me to be in him. And so, Lord, we pray for our families tonight. Lord, we pray for our children, Lord, as they, that they are uh, ministering, Lord, and, and desiring, Lord, to, to let your glory be seen. Lord, we'll be blessed if we come out and support them next week, Lord. And we just thank you right now, Lord, for what you're doing in their hearts. We have children in this place who love you. Jesus, or that says that we're heading in the right direction. And so, Lord, we thank you tonight. We ask that you continue to watch over us, keep us, watch over our families, Lord, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, Lord, sons and daughters, Lord, grandbabies and great and great greats, Lord, if there should be. Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for your love that has no end. And we give you all the praise, give you all the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.